anthropology is the study of humankind. And surely, if we want to understand humanity, there are few topics more important than religion. After all, religion is one of the ways that we make sense of our lives, our universe, and even our morality, let alone our quotidian behavior. And while it's true humans have used religious differences to exact horrific violence and emotional pain upon each other, it's also the source of unfathomable love and belonging in the form of selflessness and communion. So today, we're going to take an anthropological look at religion. We'll trace its origins and see how anthropologists have changed some of their thinking on this thing that we call religion. To begin our survey of religion and spirituality, let's travel back to Mali where I do anthropology fieldwork. Now, listen to this vignette. And I want you to think about what you might have done if you had been in my shoes. Now remember, when you're in the field as an anthropologist, you're, in a, you're not in a lab. You're in a community. And that means that the fieldwork experience is riddled with moments that teach you just as much about yourself as the people you came to study. So imagine you're an anthropologist. You've been in the field for a month. And you're finally getting the flow of the language. Every day, you've been working alongside your hosts, harvesting sorghum, but today, today's special. Today it's Ramadan, and the entire community is vibrantly dressed for the occasion. And as a sociable and informal procession passes along the dirt path in front of your house, you rush to put on that newly tailored outfit you made just for this day. So, grabbing your camera, you, you run out that door to join your host family, and Everyone works their way to the edge of the village for a special outdoor prayer service. You arrive to find all the males seated on prayer mats in neatly organized rows. But behind them, it's the women and their mats. And taking up the very rear, it's the children, and they're seated in pairs on large palm leaves. And before you know it, uh, the service begins with praying. Fortunately, you're seated on a mat with one of your new friends. His name's Isa, and he grabs your hand and brings you to your feet with a concerned yet reassuring smile. It's time to pray. Now remember, when I was in this situation, I came to it as a non-Muslim, but that shouldn't matter. I mean, I try to assure myself that. Um, I was an anthropologist doing participant observation, and everyone understood that. They knew that my M.O was to live and participate in the daily life of this community for the next couple years. I worked when they worked, I slept when they slept, and we all ate and socialized together. So, as my friend grabbed my hand and lifted me up to start the prayers, I started to watch and mirror Isa. But then panic set in. I got way too reflective. I simply couldn't determine whether or not I should be praying like this. I mean, despite being a non-Muslim, I've always been in the camp that when it comes to religion, there are many roads to the summit, but only one destination. So my panic ensued because I didn't want to offend people, and I didn't know the best way to do that. I mean, on the one hand, people could interpret my non-believing prayer as disrespectful, but then would they be even more insulted if I sat off to the side and didn't participate at all? I freaked because ultimately, I was already attached to this community and I really didn't want to mess up what was a fairly smooth transition into my new village home. So if you were a non-Muslim, and if you were there in my shoes, what would you have done? Would you just go with it and mirror Isa as you work out what to do? Or instead, do you feel so awkward about this entire situation that you make up some polite excuse like you're not well? Or Maybe you just whisper the truth to Isa and ask him if it's okay. Well, as a cultural relativist who didn't feel that praying with my host violated my own spirituality, I just went with the flow. Now, if you would have made a different choice, that doesn't mean you're a terrible anthropologist. See, as an anthropologist, it's simply up to you to work out your boundaries so that you and your host know and agree when participant observation is appropriate. Now, my response to this early fieldwork episode, it gives you a vicarious preview of how anthropologists think about religion. We study religion to study humans, not God and the great beyond. But 
What is it that distinguishes anthropological approaches to religion as opposed to, say, religious studies, for example? Well, that's exactly what we're going to work out today. And first on our list, let's start with the origins of religion. Ritual burials, feasts, cave art, and even primatology provide a fairly comprehensive glance at the origins and development of the human religious experience. Modern apes, including non-human apes, express empathy and they mourn the loss of others. And biological anthropologists like Barbara King, well, they argue that the empathy and mourning we observe in non-human apes, well, that actually can give us insight into the roots of human religious experience. Whenever I think of apes and their ability to express empathy, my thoughts, they go straight to a famous gorilla named Coco. Coco is a special gorilla who was uniquely suited to bond with her human caretakers and others. Why? Well, it's because Coco, she's mastered American Sign Language and understands human speech. Now, dubbed an experiment in interspecies communication, Project Coco, it started in 1972 when a psychology student named Penny Patterson chose to teach this young gorilla sign language for her PhD at Stanford. And, long story short, Coco's voice has revolutionized how we think about our ape relatives. I share Coco's story today because we're seeking out evidence that other apes do in fact experience a sense of loss upon the death of an acquaintance, not to mention, you know, empathy more broadly. It was in the year 2000 when Coco's companion gorilla of some 24 years, Michael, well, he passed away and it emotionally destroyed her. Crying late into the night, Coco started requesting a nightlight and during the day, she sat staring into space, her chin down and bottom lip out. She even stopped purring when she saw friends or received food. But then, less than a year later, the famous comedian Robin Williams, he visited Coco as part of this documentary film project and wow, did those two hit it off. I mean, Coco's caregivers, they remember that after months of despondent sorrow, Robin's visit, it changed everything. It was him. He had restored Coco's gleeful smile. But the story of Coco's empathy and capacity for mourning, it doesn't stop there. Sadly, the day Robin Williams passed, calls came pouring in at the Gorilla Foundation. And because Coco recognizes speech, she figured out something was terribly wrong. Dr. Patterson, she cried as she explained that Robin was gone. And Coco signed back an empathetic, cry, no. Patterson, she reported that Coco resumed a somber posture and quivering bottom lip. So years after Michael passed on, Coco, she'd lost another dear friend. Now, we've seen elephants, for example, express extreme grief upon the death of a child or family member. But what's remarkable about Coco is that she talks with us using words about her subjective experience of loss. And that's an important first step for us because as biological anthropologist Barbara King argues, the compassion, empathy, and the mourning that we see in apes like Coco, well, they give us great clues about the early foundation, the early roots of the human religious experience. So, we're not saying that empathy and mourning are religion, right? But what we are saying is that those experiences and emotions over generations and generations, well, they can evolve into what you and I recognize as modern world religions. So to see the origins of what we recognize as religion, it's time we move into archeology span and parietal art. In Fields of Blood, a book on the histories of world religions and their relationship with violence, a former nun explains that, quote, from the first, one of the major preoccupations of both religion and art, the two being inseparable, was to cultivate a sense of community with nature, the animal world, and our fellow humans. So let's look to some of the earliest art on record in search of some evidence of religious activities or imagery. And indeed, that's exactly what we'll find. Now, parietal art, as we call it, it's the term we use to describe early art found on cave walls or rocks. 
And dating back tens of thousands of years, the world's parietal art, it collectively documents our pre-modern religious life. One of my absolute favorite archaeological treasures is a mysterious supernatural image of a therianthrope found in southern France at a site named Trois Frères. Um, dating back to around 13,000 BCE, the therianthrope is half man, half animal. And his finely detailed figure with muscular legs and antlers, they dominate the large cavern that houses it. Dubbed the sanctuary, it was likely used for shamanistic rituals and trances. Archaeologists they call this image the sorcerer, or the horned god, and it's one of our earliest images of the pre-modern religious experience. Now, not far from the sanctuary is another small cavern known as the Chapel of the Lioness. Now, this image is engraved right into the wall, and it depicts a lioness on an altar of sorts, and remarkably, the people who visited this image, they place special offerings or objects right into the wall below the lioness. And that's where archaeologists have discovered all kinds of animal teeth, stone tools, and, and shells. So parietal art, that's a great window into the pre-modern religious life. And it shows that early Homo sapiens practiced shamanism, and they contemplated alternative universes as well as what happens after death. The details of the parietal art at Trois Frères, um, they're terrific because they show us some early precursors to modern world religions, and we can see evidence of rituals connecting people to a greater reality as well as to each other. But other archaeological evidence supports the theory that humans, and even Neanderthal, um, they were thinking of the great beyond and doing purposeful burials as early as 90,000 years ago. Um, that was in Israel's Kafza Cave, where archaeologists found bones and fragments from over two dozen burials. And nearby, over in Mount Carmel, we discovered purposeful burials dating to just about over 100,000 years ago. Now, that's right around the time that we transition from the archaic form of Homo sapiens into our present state as Homo sapiens modern. So, Maybe it's not too surprising that our now extinct Neanderthal cousins were also burying their dead. The most famous Neanderthal burial is called the Old Man, and he was found purposefully buried by others. And knowing he was old, frail, and essentially toothless, his remains show us that he had a small community who must have cared for in his old age and upon death. As humans continued burying their dead and seeking answers for the mysteries of life and death, we see compassion leading to purposeful burials and explorations into what lies beyond. And it's parietal art that gives us a glimpse of that some 10,000 plus years ago. But then, along the arc of the human religious experience, we start seeing more and more archaeological evidence of the ritual objects such as the nearly 4,000-year-old figurines discovered in Peru at the Vicama site. Coming in at around nine inches, the tallest of the three appears to be a priestess with a beaded necklace, long dark hair, and a face painted white, peppered with red dots. Archaeologists found the statues facing each other in a basket, and they believe the figures were actual ritual offerings for the construction of the building in which they were housed. So, with that glimpse into our pre-modern religious sensibilities, things like compassion, purposeful burials, mourning, shamanism, and even ritual objects, in some ways, the roots of the human religious experience can be found in archaeology. So let's turn our eyes to what we might consider full-fledged religion. When do the major modern world religions emerge? Well. Around 3000 BCE, we begin to see archaic religions, traditions, and rituals emerging in Mesopotamia, and then Egypt, China, and eventually in Greek, Celtic, and even Native American cultures too. But start dates for religions, they can be tricky. Because like Christianity and Judaism, uh, the history of the latter is in some ways the history of the former. Some religions, like Judaism, can be considered to have a more specific date, such as when, in the year 1812 BCE, Abraham made his covenant with God. But other religions, like Hinduism, 
they have a more nebulous starting point unless we pick an important date like the creation of the Upanishads text around 700 BCE. So yes, we see Judaism emerge as one of the first world religions, and then once we get to around 2.5 thousand years ago, something happens all around the world as we see humankind developing one new religion after another. I mean, we get Jainism around 600 BCE, with Zoroastrianism not long after that. And then we see Buddhism emerge right around 400 BCE. And after that, we have another burst of New World religions when we get Christianity around the year 30 CE. Then Islam arrives around 600 years after that. More recently, we see Sikhism begin in the 1400s, followed by the Baha'i and Mormon faiths of the 1800s. And you know what? Humanity hasn't stopped there. Right in the 20th century, uh, we developed new religious traditions including Rastafarianism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and even the St. John Coltrane Church in San Francisco. In sum, up to around 1400, most of Europe was in the Dark Ages, while China, Africa, the Arab world, India, and parts of the Mediterranean thrived. And that explains the early rise of world religions in the Middle East and Asia. They had the art the technology, scholars, and trade routes to both build and spread religion. But then, Europe rose from the 1400s on as sailing technologies, the printing press, and the Protestant Reformation ushered in the Enlightenment. Thereafter, the Atlantic slave trade and the expansion of global empires only further fueled this rapid growth. And that's when anthropology comes in, connecting new corners of the world that hadn't yet touched. So, anthropologists were making sense of a world full of religious rituals and practices, uh, among other things. So, let's see what they found. Let's see how anthropologists have deconstructed and made sense of world religions. By the time Edward Burnett Tyler and anthropology emerge in the late 1800s, the work of two scholars forged the foundation for what later becomes the anthropology of religion. Now, borrowing from our sociological cousin, Emile Durkheim, the anthropology of religion essentially starts with him. In one of his most important works, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, Durkheim explains that religion is a social phenomenon that hinders our selfish individualistic proclivities and instead promotes social cooperation. For Durkheim, religious symbols used during religious rituals they help reinforce this collective consciousness and cooperation. And as a result, individuals are dependent on society as they are on God. And Durkheim, he points out that societies, and this is religion at work here, societies classify all things into two piles. There's either the sacred or the profane. Now, the sacred, that's the social, the ideal, the, the divine, whereas the profane, that's the personal, physical, and earthly realms. So, from this sociological pioneer, we begin to discover the mechanics of modern world religions. Ultimately, in any religion, rituals help promote and prescribe that which is sacred, and thus allow us the opportunity to dwell within the sacred ourselves. In 1890, James Fraser published a second foundational text on the anthropology of religion, The Golden Bough, A Study in Magic and Religion. Now, this immensely popular book was a compendium of accounts of world religious practices from all around the world. And Fraser's big idea was that archaic religions were basically fertility cults, and they provided opportunities to worship and make periodic offerings or sacrifices to a sacred king. Uh, he also concluded that the great arc of the human religious experience takes humanity from an initial magical phase through to the religious belief and then culminating in scientific thought. Fraser, like Tyler, and many of his contemporaries, they were cultural evolutionists who were keen on studying so-called primitive religions. Why? Well, it's because they were searching for clues about the origins of religion as a socio-cultural phenomenon. They wanted to explain when and how religion begins. And in their search for those origins, 
they went with cultural evolution or social Darwinism. You see, they were sure that traditional religions uh, in remote corners of Africa and the South Pacific, that they were living windows into the primitive pre-religious lives of humankind. To these cultural evolutionists, the monotheism of Abrahamic faiths was the most advanced form of religious belief, behind which other religions lagged at a lingering evolutionary pace. So, according to these folks, what's the primary difference between primal religions versus these advanced world religions? Well, advanced religions, they focus on texts, while primitive religions are oral traditions. In addition, advanced religions, they focus on the afterlife and are quite universal in scope. They apply across cultures, unlike the primitive religions, which are really more culturally specific. And last, advanced religions, well, they compartmentalize the sacred and profane. But with primitive religions, religion and daily life, they're organically intertwined and inseparable. So that's the prevailing thought on religion and religious diversity, or at least it was at the dawn of anthropology. And E.B. Tyler was right there with the evolution of religion. Now, the racial context of cultural evolutionism, that certainly tarnishes Tyler's legacy as one of the earliest anthropologists, but he is still widely regarded as a pioneer in the anthropology of religion. Tyler, he assumed that the stages of humanity's material advancement also corresponded with our parallel stages of our spiritual nature. <laughs> and oddly, Tyler himself, uh, he had interests outside of the confines of so-called conventional monotheism. Um, he didn't write about this publicly, but he was really into the spiritualist movement because he was intrigued by claims of their evidence that the human personality actually continues after death. So, Tyler represents for us the moment in anthropology when primitive religions were all the rage. And we'll label this era the origins era as evolution-oriented questions were at the heart of anthropological inquiry, especially in Tyler's day. But Tyler and cultural evolutionists, they weren't the only people investigating world religions. Some rising anthropology stars like Franz Boas and Bronislaw Malinowski, they emerged around the turn of the 20th century, and as we've seen in earlier lectures, they refused to accept the pseudoscience of social Darwinism and the cultural evolutionists. These gentlemen and their scores of students were a new and highly influential wave of cultural relativists, and they were curious about the sociocultural functions of religion, very much in the Durkheim tradition. It was in a 1925 essay on religion that Malinowski distinguishes the difference between magic and religion. Now, drawing on Fraser's magic, religion, science discussion, magic, Malinowski says, is always utilitarian, and magic rituals are generally expected to get very specific results, like healing a sick stomach. Now, religion, on the other hand, that was different, specifically, Religious rituals usually focus on more ambiguous results. I mean, you don't take communion or fast for a month because you expect the priest himself to cure your stomach ache or whatever else ails you. It's more like the God moves in mysterious ways kind of thing. Malinowski and the cultural relativists, they didn't just read up on comparative religions from their armchairs, no. These science-minded scholars, they left their desks and they did long-term participant observation in field research. And living day-to-day -day with their research communities, the cultural relativists, they ended up paying much less attention to the origins of religion. Instead, they sought to unveil the inner mindset of exotic people, including the practical and rational nature of their religious life and rituals. You see, for them, anthropology of religion that was about deciphering the sociocultural function of rituals and religious life. Now, cultural relativity in the anthropology of religion, that endured well into the 20th century, with students of Malinowski and Boaz taking their questions to new regions and new people. One Malinowski student who worked in Africa among pastoralists and farmers, Edward Evans Pritchard, he focused on social systems 
So naturally, he looked into local religious practices of his East African study communities. When he did, he broke away from the primitive modern lens, and instead, he portrayed the rational and the functional dimensions of religious practice. His main argument was that for the Azande and newer people, as well as any other group, rituals sustain and moderate social structures. Another Malinowski student, Alfred Radcliffe Brown, he collected field data that helped him argue that myths maintain and reinforce social structure and order. After all, especially among the Adaman Islanders that he studied with, people need group solidarity in order to survive. And it's religious rituals that generate this solidarity. Uniquely, Radcliffe Brown analyzed myths using binaries like the sacred and the profane, and he inspired a whole new way to do the anthropology of religion. An emerging interpretivist critique of strict empiricist anthropology stemmed from the idea that regardless of how long an anthropologist does field research, he or she will never get the real picture, a full and truly authentic picture. These critiques, they ushered in yet another way for anthropologists to explore and understand religion. Now, the new phase often focused inward rather than outward, and its holy grail was the search for meaning, symbolism, basically interpreting myths. Now, we don't have enough time to go deep into this interpretivist school, but two preeminent figures, Claude Levi-Strauss and Clifford Geertz, they can help us quickly work out this less empirical approach to understanding world religions and the religious experience in general. Like Radcliffe Brown and Durkheim, Levi-Strauss explored the idea that universally, humans are wired to see and understand our world through binaries, like raw and cooked, wild and civilized, let alone sacred and profane. And he says it's religion, right, that works to mediate all of these binaries. So rather than an evolutionary lens to explore religion, Levi-Strauss asserted that so-called primitive and modern religions, structurally speaking, they're the same. We're both structurally working out the ultimate binary, what is sacred and what is profane. And putting aside the surface level content of religions, Levi-Strauss focused on the structure of their myths and stories, among other things, because that structure, he said that reveals the social, political, economic, and even the cosmological dimensions of humanity. Similarly, Clifford Geertz, he also used a structural approach. In fact, his anthropological definition of religion, it summarizes the way many of us approach religion in our work today. Simply put, Geertz says that religion is how we make meaning. To paraphrase, religion, it's a system of symbols which motivate and emotionally resonate with people. And it does this by articulating a general order of existence, one that gives meaning to our lives and to all of existence. Now, beyond Levi-Strauss and Geertz, scholars continue to look at the structural and symbolic dimensions of religion. And researchers have developed even more ways to anthropologically cast even more light on humanity's diverse religious practices or beliefs, despite the structural unity of human religious experience. Now, one brief example of feminist approaches they look at religion as a social institution with gendered relations of power. Now, feminists have also enriched the anthropology of religion by examining female deities in goddess cultures in pre-Judeo-Christian times. And I'd love to dive deeper into that, but it's time that we wrap things up. Now, today, we've seen that there are plenty of reasonable ways to define and study religion, even amongst just us anthropologists. But nonetheless, we can summarize the past century or so of the anthropology of religion into three major streams, right? There's the functional approach of Boaz and Malinowski that looks at the roles religion plays in society. Then there's that analytic approach of Evans Pritchard that asked, how is religion manifested in society? And last, we got to the more essentialist school of Levi-Strauss and Geertz, and they analyzed the basic nature of religion itself. So, to wrap this up, 
religion, it can be a difficult topic to discuss because, uh, really, because of its primacy in our lives. But with anthropology, we get traction on this slippery slope because our quest is not to improve our understanding of God. We're not out to prove or disprove the existence of anyone's God, right? I mean, this isn't metaphysics here. Instead, we study religion to understand humankind. So, the next time you may find yourself having difficulty relating to someone else's religious practices and beliefs, take a moment and try to connect with them anyway. Try out a little anthropology of religion without that fear of trespass that I encountered when I started my fieldwork in Mali. And remember, you don't have to abandon your own faith or lack thereof to embrace and understand our common humanity. All you need is just a little anthropology.